Hello. I don't ordinarily tell people I think I'm enlightened. I don't really see the point. It's not like they're gonna believe in me. I don't normally tell people what I'm gonna record here today for the same reason. And you know, if you go around telling people, oh, I've seen the universe in all its glory. I have left my mind and traveled to the other dimension where you can see what reality looks like. I mean, that, that's, it's conceited. It begs the question, um, what is this person going to demand of me? Am I supposed to somehow treat them like they're better than me? You know, am I trying to put myself above others? Um, am I trying to earn respect? Or quite the contrary, if you say something like that, I, I imagine. Pretty much the only way a person's going to be taken seriously, I figure, and from what I've observed, is if they have a, a teaching pedigree showing that people with teaching pedigrees have taught them. It's like with witchcraft school. Um, there are two kinds of witches in the community, like when you're dealing with other witches. They're like, oh, you took witchcraft classes. You, you, you've been initiated. By whom? And then if I tell them with whom I was initiated and educated, um, that's a person who has is, is known in the community and has uh, a, a, a student lineage, if you will, that goes back to well-respected originators of modern witchcraft. So then I get, you know, oh, well, okay, Maybe you know something. Uh, most of my knowledge is self-taught, yet what I learned in those seven months of class and then in, in follow-up interactions has more value than the years of study I've put in personally. And that's just the way humans are. We don't want to recognize, we don't want to make the mistake of recognizing someone has learned it only to find out that they're a hoaxer that they're a fast-talking lead you on. So let me put it out there right now. I don't expect anything from you for this. It's not really important whether you believe me. But I ache to share the beauty I've seen, the peace it's given me, the visions, and the understanding. So while you enjoy my sideways lava lamp video footage, here's what I'm going to tell you. So, first off, I fancy myself a farrier of souls. And whether it's fancy imagination or true act action, like any other belief in things above and beyond hard science, it's faith and we'll know when we die or we won't. And it's okay. And uh, in that, hang on a sec, I have to pause this. No, it didn't pause. I just needed to look and see what the time on the recorder is. In that ferrying of souls, and that happens in the middle of the night, I'll wake up, and someone, I've heard of someone passing. Once, very rarely, someone might actually wake me, and I'll have a sense that there's someone there. And... Um, I mean, magic is in the imagination. So I go ahead and accept this sense, and I say hello. And uh, you get a feel of their mind and my mind, and it's not so much conversation as it is an understanding of ideas, which my brain then translates into language. And this will be a soul who has died and is asking what they're supposed to do. And I will answer to them, you have choices. You may stick around like this, or you may move to the next lifetime, the next life, the next. You may move to the next. I don't really say the next what, I just say move to the next, because it's kind of understood. The next level, the next stage, the next, you know, move through, leave this behind and move forward. Uh, if they choose to stay, Generally, it won't last very long because when you are a ghost, 
you have no body. You have no nerves. We're talking complete sensory deprivation. We're also talking about no brain in which to learn and acquire new knowledge, develop character. Um, and even memory starts getting worse and worse. You only have the memory you had when you died in the first place. And then that just kind of starts to, to, to glitch. And um, at times you forget yourself. And so to, to float around being a ghost, um, you know, a child may fancy it as amusing. <coughs> and perhaps it is entertaining for the first few days. But mostly it's just cold, dark, and lonely. And the only persons you can see are those with whom you have an emotional connection and the fairy men, people like me. They're, they're like little lights on a river, and you can see them, and you can fly to them, and you can ask them what to do. When they want to move to the next stage, I gesture cycled psychically over my left shoulder. And for them, that is over their left shoulder, because it's over everyone's left shoulder. But when you gesture over the left shoulder, the soul understands. It turns in that direction on itself. And there you see another light. One that was there, but you didn't pay attention to. Just It's just the moon in the sky, really. It looks like the moon. The full moon. Up there. And I say, go to the moon. You know, go there. Fly towards it. And I go with them, in psychically, in spirit. I go with them right up to the gate. I don't go through the gate, for I'm a living soul. But I take them to the door. And as you approach it, it becomes a large arched entryway, a doorway in the sky, if you will, in the darkness, just hanging there like you've seen in, in movies. And the light it's coming from, it goes from silver to gold. It becomes so golden. Um, you have the sense that the sunlight is sparkling off of a dragon's treasure hoard. It's so bright. And it just becomes brighter and brighter until... Finally, your eyes adjust. You don't have eyes, but, you know, until it, it, you are able to see the light and everything behind you has gone black. There is no other sense. No lights of fairies, ferrymen in the distance. No lights of the hearts of the loved ones. Um, no sense of space. What was becomes irrelevant. And the soul passes through the door. And uh, us as living souls can only look through it. And inside you see what what amounts to one of those, if you watched Harry Potter with the, um, the fates, the, the globes of fate, there was a library of fates, and, and each glowing globe sat on a shelf, and the aisles between the shelves went forever. This is like a great library, and the stacks go forever. Um, quite literally, really. And it's, it's conceptual, it's not physically somewhere, so there really is no ending, and I suppose, I don't know, you just travel at the speed of thought through them. And the shelves themselves, they look like those uh, sort your nuts and bolts plastic see-through drawers you buy at the hardware store. Tons and tons of tiny little boxes in clear containers lined up as high and as far as you can as, as there is, it just, just, it just keeps going off into the point of infinity in every direction. And each one of these little drawers is shining with a golden light, and that is where the light is coming from, from inside these drawers, beaming out through the transparent fronts. You may take a close look at any drawer you like, as a spirit who is dead. You may approach these, and you may look at them. And each one of them will give you information when you look at it, as to uh, the starting point, the overall story arc of that life, you know, location, drives, personality, the characters of the um, other individuals in that life's experience, and to a degree, the length of that life. Um, it's not fair to say that the future is written, 
So you cannot say that when a person will die, and yet I know exactly when I will die, have always known. And uh, my faith was shaken recently by a severe illness. But again, here I am, having conquered an illness that nobody thought I would. Clearly, I am meant to live as long as I thought. And so the, and, and these lives include the lives of everything living, even bacteria. Although, um, I don't know, actually, I think everything's sentient. I, I, I can't see that bacteria really are more than little Autobots. In fact, a lot of insects are probably just little biological microbots. But everything's sentient, squirrels, trees, Yes, trees are sentient. Uh, they, they develop sentience over time. A baby tree, like a baby human, there's not a whole lot going on there except for the drive to life, like a little animal. And then as time passes, it develops, just like a child does, into a full personality. And, uh, you know, an oak tree looks like an oak tree, not a maple tree, just as a child has a character already, uh, but it doesn't fully form right away. But trees, birds, mammals, humans, we all have sentience. We all have a soul. So a soul might, for instance, say, hey, this is a puppy that's going to cross paths with this loved one that I've left behind. If I inhabit this puppy, I can be with that loved one for the next 10 years or 20 years. 25 years. I mean, that's a rare age for a dog. But some small dogs will live that long. So, for instance, someone who dies with a, ch with a child might well choose to return as that child's favorite pet. Or may choose to return as even a sparrow living in the yard of the person they've left behind, to whom they're attached. Uh, I suppose even hatred could cause you to come back. You might want to come back as the uh, crow that never shuts up in the tree outside of your neighbor's window. <laughs> Thing is, you know, if you come back as one of these animals, you do have the lifespan of that animal. So if, if you don't want to sit and crow outside your neighbor's window for 15 years, you better not come back as a crow. <laughs> Although that crow can choose to fly off and do something else. Uh, a tree, for instance, might be a choice for someone who wants to just stop and rest for an eon. Just rest in quiet and peace and meditation. I think a lot of Buddhas might have become trees. So this is how reincarnation happens. When you've selected, you fly in. So really, you are the author of your own life, right here, right now. Your soul is the reason why you keep making that same mistake. Because that mistake is important. And the experience you're having making it is why you're here. And so you keep making it. And it may be that learning your way out of it is the goal of this life. But it may also be that simply knowing what it feels like to be the person you are is the only reason you're here. And that takes me to stage two of this talk. Why are we here? We are all part of one being. All sentient life and the energy that animates inanimate objects, the energy between the particles of the atoms, the energy that flies off the sun, the energy of air moving when you, when you wave your arm. Energy underlies everything on the level of physics. And you can ask a physicist this, and they will agree, yes, energy is the only thing we can truly say that exists. Everything else is constructed from it. And to what degree it's constructed from it versus what our mind is making of it, it's kind of sketchy. Um, are you looking at this computer? Wait, no. You are receiving light from it in your eyes. And your brain is taking the striking of that light choosing which portions of it to pay attention to, and constructing an idea from it. And that idea is perceived as an image. So you're watching your computer, but you're actually simply receiving energy. How about what you're listening to? 
You're listening to my voice? <laughs> no, no, you're not. You're listening to the vibration of the air molecules next to your ear that go into your ear. And they are being affected by the electromagnetics of the speaker that transmits what represents my voice. My voice has gone from vibrating the air through my mouth to a transducer in my recorder, which moved with the vibration of air and was then encoded electrically onto memory. Then it was turned into, it, well, it was digital. Then it was, it was manipulated until it was part of this video. And then the reverse process was used to create the sound off of your speaker, which vibrates the air, which your ears have a little little drum in them that picks up the vibrations and turns it back into electricity because your nerves are running on a form of electricity and so your brain is then taking those electrical dot dot dashes and constructing from them an idea of what my voice sounds like and from that then further constructing an idea of an idea the idea I'm transmitting out of language it's it's quite astonishing, but at the bottom level, it's all energy. We are energy. And we cannot truly say whether what we're looking at is what is there, or are we just creating it out of a whole lot of bouncing around energy in the world by selecting what applies and ignoring what does not. Have you listened to the ticking of that clock lately or the sound of your fridge running? Have you noticed the fans in your computer recently. They're there, but your brain doesn't pay attention to them. So too, your brain isn't paying attention to the ultraviolet light, even though it can burn your skin. And in that sense, it's paying attention. So as you can see, your brain is constructing your world from a whole lot of flying energy. And even your body, there is more space filled with energy then there is matter. And every time we get deeper and deeper into what matter is, we find again energy fields bouncing against each other. A solid thing is solid because the energy fields, like a magnetic jar or a force field, make it seem solid because the force field between the atoms of your finger and the force field between the atoms of your keyboard bounce off each other. And is that because your brain wants them to? Or is that because they cannot cross each other? Well, there are a lot of reports in the olden days of people who could do ridiculous things like swim in dirt and walk on water. So, you know, reports of people who can move through solid walls, can put their hand through things. So perhaps it is possible, in fact, to disconnect your expectations of reality and become one of these superhuman beings who simply moves as a thought because the world is constructed of energy. Now the final third of this, all this energy is one thing, a thing, divided into millions of things. Like when you think of Google headquarters, you think of a thing, it's Google. You interface with it as a single thing. And yet, if you go to Google, you will find out that it's a lot of computers, a lot of hard drives, a lot of individual things all working in concert. And then when you stop to think about it, all of the computers uh, making up the Internet are all individual things creating one large thing with their energy. So too are you, your neighbor, your loved ones, your pets, the trees outside, and even the rocks. The energy that makes us up is all part of one thing because it's all connected because there are so many sentient minds it has a mind of its own the way Google polls I remember when Google was called dogpile and it was actually the first time anybody ever went and said okay not only will I query my own memory database but that of the other search engines I will go ask all of these 15 different search engines, and there were a lot back then, for their information. And each search engine had its own little batch of knowledge, but didn't know everything. 
But when you pulled all of them at once and brought up results, it was phenomenal what you could pick up, and Dogpile would do that. And so in that sense, all of us together are creating one hive mind, if you will. That's God. That's what we think of as God. That is the great mind. And I had the occasion to perceive it one time as though it had a physical shape and presence. If you've ever seen a, a, a drawing of a magnetic sphere, you know, the, the magnetic force field around the Earth, um, the magnetic shape of a magnet, just the shape of the energy coming off of a magnet. If you take a look at it, you'll notice that it's roughly donut shaped. They call that a torus. There is a ring and the energy moves around the outside and down through the middle and back up around the outside. Well, imagine that as vast as the universe and filled with everything that exists. And at the center are all the black holes. And perhaps each galaxy is its own god. Perhaps each galaxy is an individual. And we, our Milky Way, are one of them. And perhaps we are even the first one where it managed to actually create its own tiny minions of life, you know, living flesh beings. Maybe. I get the sense that we are the first. But that's neither here nor there because we won't, we won't get out of our solar system in my lifetime. That's for the future and I am starting to believe we'll get there in spite of all of the strife around us. So that great donut shaped, that great torus of life, it's, it's so beautiful because everything of life is in it. And, and if you could stop and, and look across the torus, you could see any point in time. You could know it. And the torus itself does know that it is following in a linear fashion, flowing around its outside and down through the middle. It, start, it has an origination point, the Big Bang, where it starts paying attention to who and what it is and starts living. So each iteration of life, whether, whether it's that of a, an orphan in Calcutta who dies young or a wealthy man who becomes president of the United States with, without ever having to be called on his lies and, and gets everything he ever wanted and nobody ever calls him on it. Whatever that, or, or just an ordinary human being with a boring job and, and a hobby on the weekends. All of these different lives that we live are variations of how a life can be lived. And the great life, God, is looking at itself. So who am I? What does it mean to be me? What does it mean to be alive? And in order to answer that question, puts out tiny bits of itself into these little VR simulations where each one of us exists as a living human self-contained awareness of self. And some of those lives involve knowing that it's all a dream. And some of those lives involve not knowing that it's all a dream. Some of those lives involve following one's bestial impulses. And some involve learning to rise above those. If you can imagine, just take your life and say, if only I had turned left instead of right that day, that's another variation of life that can be lived. And that person springs into being, has sprung into being, must spring into being. And when life has finally exhausted every possibility, and from our point of view, that's an infinity. And from life's point of view, right here, right now, there is no end. But, of course, whenever you count, you eventually stop counting and run out of items. And that's when it all shrinks down into a black hole and becomes nothing. And then Big Bang starts again. I like to call that moment, and then God blinked. Because at that point, life reviews what it's just been through. It remembers it. It says, oh, yeah, all that stuff that just happened, let's take a look. 
And it starts from the beginning and works its way through. And so too, so you have an infinity. You have an infinity of lives happening infinite number of times. And God blinked. And you, my friend, are one of those. And if there's any job or task held to you, it is to help all of us, through your own learning, understand how to move through this with love and grace and compassion, to be a kinder, happier, more loving version of that. Because that's what you bring back with you when you die. You bring back the deep understandings that you've acquired in life, those moments of epiphany where you said, ah, to steal is to cause someone to distrust the world. So it's not about what they lost in material. It's about what they lost in trust. And I created a less happy world just by taking a chocolate bar. That kind of an epiphany goes with you. Or, oh my goodness, you have to be nice to these people because they're hurting. And there but for the grace of God go I. And that is a lesson you take with you. And all of us benefit. But like putting one drop of food coloring in the ocean, we may not notice. But it's there. And as we've noticed from plastic, it'll build up if you put enough of it in. And that accounts for love too. So go out, figure out for me. How do I love a little harder? How do I love a little longer? How do I accept my anger? How do I accept my self-pity? How do I move out of it and accept this world that I clearly chose and promote because someone had to live it? And let's face it, if someone else had lived your life, that person would be you right now, would think of itself as you. It is you. You can very well just sit there and go, okay, I got my wish. I blinked off into a new life, but the person sitting in this room must be this person. And now that's me. And I moved from another life I don't remember, which presumably was worse. Go ahead, think it. I used to imagine that I had straight hair because I had been a curly-haired girl who wished for straight hair. And that was how I overcame wishing for curly hair. I noticed that all the girls with straight hair wanted it curled, and all the girls with curly hair wanted it straight. So I just decided... I was a girl who wished to have straight hair and got her wish. But, as magic works, I wasn't allowed to remember. So think that. The next time you're sitting in your life and going, why me, why me? Just imagine for a moment that this was your better deal. And say, okay, how do I handle this? How do I cope with this? And go out and love someone today.